Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Addiction, Trauma, Racism, What's the Connection? My name is Orlando Cooper, one of the graduate assistants at IHEC, and I'll be your moderator. I am Assistant Madison, the Assistant Director for the Illinois Higher Education Center for Alcohol, Other Drug, and Violent Prevention, and we are very excited to be hosting today's event. Before I hand over the microphone, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about today's webinar and the GoToWebinar platform. For those of you new to using GoToWebinar, you will see the control panel on the right of your screen. This is where you will find the question box that you can type and submit to at the end of the presentation. All attendees will be muted for today's program, but that doesn't mean you can't participate. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Rael Grayson. The stage is yours. Hello, thank you, Orlando. Thank you for everybody. Uh, for being here this morning. As Orlando said, my name is Rael Grayson. Pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor and certified drug and alcohol counselor and work in private practice at Head Heart Therapy, which is a uh, location on the north side of Chicago. So I hold a couple of different roles on the team as the executive director and um, a therapist as well. So I do see about a handful of clients uh, per week as well. So we're going to go ahead and jump into it. I got a lot of information to share with all of you uh, today. Hopefully I'm able to get to all of the, the information and all of the slides. Um, so here we go. We're going to start with some objectives. Um, I think of objectives as a place where we can really use these things to inspire ourselves to, to make changes in our own life that would really a positive, positively affect the way that we work with individuals and in particular students for many of you um, and it's really this approach of in, encouraging uh, yourselves and, and others in which you work with to learn about and increase knowledge around some of the topics that I will discuss today. So I'm going to talk about trauma-informed care, I'm going to talk about addiction and trauma, we'll watch a video that really will kind of help tie these things together, I'll talk about racial trauma, um, race-based traumatic stress, historical and cultural implications, um, and hopefully if you have some time, I'll get into the post-traumatic growth and resilience and coping and healing. Um, so hopefully information that I share today is, is new to you. Um, if not, maybe it will serve as a reminder to you. Um, I always like to give a little disclaimer that I'm not here to shame or blame or belittle or attack anyone. Just share some, just share some information with all of you. And I do like to give a little bit of a, a warning that some of the information or some of the things that I talk about could be triggering. So please do whatever you need to um, in order to take care of yourself. That means turning the volume down um, or whatever that looks like for you. So I'm gonna start with talking about trauma-informed care, uh, which is really the beginning of, of understanding trauma um, and really implementing some of these approaches into the way that we work with others and the way we show up for other people. So how, we, how are we fundamentally making a change in our approach to working maybe with students or ourselves, our individuals in our community? What's the language that we're using? So trauma-informed care is an approach that recognizes that an individual is, is more likely than not to have a trauma history. So trauma-informed care recognizes the presence of trauma symptoms and acknowledges the role trauma may play in an individual's life. So that's including yourselves or maybe uh, the students you serve or people around you, people in your community. Trauma-informed care understands and considers the per pervasive nature of trauma and really promotes environments of, of healing and recovery rather than practices and services and approaches that may inadvertently re-traumatize somebody, which I'll talk more about um, in a few moments. So the intention of trauma-informed care is not really to treat symptoms or issues that may be related to somebody's trauma. So from a perspective of sexual or physical, emotional abuse or any other form of trauma, but it's really a way to provide services in a way that are accessible and appropriate to those who may have experienced trauma. So when we don't really use these approaches or really stray away from trauma-informed approaches, the possibility of triggering or exasperating trauma symptoms or re-traumatizing the person really increases. So the primary goal is really to prevent re-traumatization in, in the person and in the individual that you are communicating with. And so the idea of re-traumatization is any situation or environment that actually resembles an individual's trauma so literally or symbolically 
which can trigger these really difficult uh, emotions and feelings and reactions that really mimic the original trauma. So we really have this paradigm shift of trauma-informed care, and we start asking, what happened to you? What have you experienced? Rather than, what is wrong with you? Or another example would be, what's strong rather than what's wrong? So trauma-informed care also is a way in which we view other people as well. So oftentimes it could be in any situation, yes, in the education system, even in my, uh, even in my line of work as well, that we often use certain words uh, to describe individuals, maybe that they're difficult, they're non-compliant, they don't do what you tell them to do, right? Or they're showing up or having these um, unhealthy behaviors of, of things that, that just are not adding up, they're not making sense, right? All of these things. And we use these words really to describe individuals. And that can really leave us feeling the sense of dread and overwhelm. It can allow us feeling burnout, frustrated, right? Or really kind of detached from some of these, some of these things that we're witnessing. So how do we really explain why a person is doing something poorly, which really leads directly to what you're going to do about it too. So we think of this, if we don't have all of the information, how can we really give all of the support that, we, that this person may need? So our good intentions usually really lead us to kind of jump straight to fixing somebody's problem. Um, and that's not always the, the case. So, and that's part of thinking about, you know, we don't even know much about the problem. So rather than just assuming these things, how can I gather the information to make sure that I'm able to support this person? So SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, really different, differentiates uh, trauma-informed approaches from trauma-specific services. And so the trauma-informed approach is really guided by um, the, the assumptions of the four R's that you see listed here. And so a program that really is or an organization, an agency, or an individual who's really trauma-informed really incorporates these four R's into how they show up or interact with others. So realization, right? Realizing about trauma and how it can affect people and groups, which is this widespread impact of trauma and understands potential paths for recovery and for healing. It recognizes the signs of trauma in students, in families, in your community, in individuals who you, who you interact with on a regular basis, right? And this way, when we have this recognition, we're able to respond, and then we can resist re-traumatizing. So when we take these steps, we're really afforded the benefits of increasing safety for everyone. We really improve so our social environment and quality of services. We reduce negative encounters and events. We create a community of hope, healing, recovery, and really promote wellness amongst our programs, organizations, students, um, and communities. And so these uh, four R's um, really operate under these six key uh, principles, which I'm not gonna chat about today just because of the sake of time. I'm just gonna briefly mention them, um, but they, they really operate under safety, trustworthy, trustworthy and transparency peer support, which is rooted in collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, right, allowing others to use their voice, giving them a choice to do so, cultural and historical and gender issues. So with all of these principles, really create an environment that respects, indiv respects an individual's experience and manages the incidents of re-traumatization. And so I have this, the Plymouth uh, Trauma Lens Model, which was created by the Academy of Social Work in Plymouth, which is a, a city located in the UK. And I really like how they have taken this model uh, and really put it into this um, really colorful wheel here so that you can kind of see, okay, am I, am I implementing and using these approaches in the way in which I show up um, with others, right? So becoming trauma-informed is not an end date, it's a process. So it's a journey um, that really can be conceptualized within these, these four stages here, right? Being trauma aware. Is our staff, is our team, right? Are they trauma aware? Do they understand trauma and its effects and survivor adaptations, which we'll chat more about? Are they trauma sensitive, right? The, the agency or organization program, right? Is it integrating some of the concepts of this trauma-informed approach into its day-to-day -day operations? Are we trauma responsive? 
right? Are we recognizing and responding to trauma, enabling change in behavior, and really strengthening resilience and, and implementing protective factors? And are we trauma informed, right? The culture of the whole system, including all of the work, practices, and settings that really reflect this trauma informed approach. And so I have an illustration here. Um, that says, are you seeing individuals through a trauma lens? And so we all see the world through a different lens. We all see things very differently. We all can experience the same exact event or same exact uh, trauma, and we really can experience it in a very different way. And so many, if not all of us, probably have, have had a traumatic experience. And some of us have been able to maybe heal or move forward from some of those things, but that's not always the case for everybody. So we really are using this trauma-informed approach or showing up with this trauma lens. It's really important that we continue to keep scanning the whole person and not really just honing in on this one specific thing because then we miss the whole story. We miss somebody's whole picture. And sometimes it's really easy to get caught up in one thing rather than seeing the whole picture. Right, so an example would be maybe somebody not showing up to class or maybe not turning in assignments or, or whatever. We can focus on this one thing without taking oftentimes into consideration maybe what's going on with this person. So what is trauma? So we know that trauma is really this, this widespread and harmful and costly public health problem. And it occurs uh, as a result of violence, abuse, neglect, loss, disaster, right? The pandemic. Um, and other emotionally harmful experiences. And so we know that trauma is, if there's no regard to your age, your socioeconomic status, your ethnic or cultural background, geography, any of those things. It's almost this universal experience that, that people with mental health and or substance use disorders um, really have. And it is it's something that we all probably can relate to. So the, the need to address trauma is really increasingly viewed as an important component of, of effective behavioral and mental health care for anybody. And so SAMHSA really defines trauma and highlights these three specific elements of the definition, right? So individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of, cir set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as overwhelming or life-changing, and that has profound effects on the individual's psychological development, or well-being, often involving a physiological, social, and or spiritual impact. So the individual's ability really to integrate his, her, or their emotional experience is essentially overwhelmed um, with the individual experience, which is very subjective, right? We, we all experience things very differently. There's a threat to the person's life. It's a threat to their bodily integrity or sanity. So trauma shapes our whole belief system, the way in which we see the world, our sense of identity, our spirituality. It's this sense of disconnection from ourselves, right? Trauma is relative, meaning that what's traumatic depends on our vulnerability. So an example would be um, a, a child, right? So children are typically dependent on their caregivers for survival and safety. So they're more vulnerable to traumatization. And we see this through uh, neglect, through um, parental fighting, witnessing violence, exposure to domestic violence, and oftentimes the secondary effects of parental PTSD or complex trauma, which I'm gonna chat more about in the next couple of slides, um, or you know medical issues, right? Death of a parent and so many other things that we can list here. And so because of that, some some children are are not as or some children are more vulnerable than others. Typically, if we compare children to adults, yes, much more vulnerable. So trauma um, trauma makes it hard to be in the here and now, right? Trauma is a normal response to an abnormal situation. So it's not just the painful experience, but it's also this absence of needs being met by caregivers or loved ones as a result of the experience. So PTSD, which is probably the most common form of trauma that we hear uh, people say aloud or we hear people vo voice, um, is also known as shock trauma. It's also known as acute trauma. Sometimes in the therapy world, we refer to it as big, big T trauma. 
uh, and it's usually a one-time event and often has a, a distinct end date. So the event is extreme enough to threaten the person's emotional and physical security and safety, and it creates a lasting impression on the person's mind. So if it's not addressed through some type of medical or behavioral health, it really has significant effects on the way the person thinks and behaves. So we can think of the examples I have here, car accidents, natural disasters, witnessing violence, a sudden loss of, sudden loss of a loved one. And then we have complex trauma, which is also known as complex PTSD, um, which is the discussion really of complex PTSD has really been at the forefront of a lot of treatment and healing modalities. Um, and we're seeing more and more people uh, actually in the therapy space really seeking healing services from its impact. And that's because it's different from PTSD in that it's prolonged, it's continuous. And so individuals are unable to um, escape, uh, uh, they're unable to escape some of the uh, difficulties or, or continuous uh, traumatic events that are uh, repetitive. And so unresolved trauma really can lead people to feeling hopeless and ashamed, um, this type of trauma, complex trauma, and oftentimes for people a lifetime, people don't get treatment or seek services for its impact. And CPTSD is often referred to as developmental trauma as well. And it's referred to developmental trauma because it typically happens um, early in life when the brain is still in a developing age. And so that's sometimes why it's referred to as little T trauma. And so it's this repeated chronic experiences of developmental um, and or shock trauma. So some of the, the key differences if we're talking about repetitive behaviors uh, for complex trauma as it relates to PTSD is behavioral difficulties. Right, so these things that happen to children in their early life really uh, present and show up later in adult life, maybe in a way that's no longer serving them, but we see them in a range of uh, difficulties. So as I mentioned, behavioral difficulties. So we'll see more impulsivity, really self-destruction, alcohol and drug use, sexual acting out. We'll see it in emotional difficulties, right? So this affect liability, maybe in rage, depression, anxiety, cognitive difficulties, so dissociation and changes in somebody's personal identity, really disconnecting from themselves, interpersonal difficulties, so really these chaotic personal and social relationships, or somatization, which is it shows up in, in our body, so maybe presenting as headaches or chest pains um, or insomnia and many other things that, that it just shows up that it um, may not even be correlated. Some people wouldn't even think it's related to um, a history of experiencing trauma. And then we have vicarious trauma, sometimes called secondary trauma or compassion, compassion fatigue, which is oftentimes which who we, the caretakers, or maybe uh, professors or people in administrative staff uh, really experience from taking care of individuals who are experiencing trauma. So it's this emotional residue of exposure that we have from working or interacting with individuals and hearing their trauma stories, right? Or really becoming witness to their pain or really becoming witness to their fear or terror that they may carry with them. So it's really this state of tension and preoccupation that, that we can hold on to. So example of, of secondary trauma, um, a really prime example would be maybe the individuals who were at the, at the location where George Floyd was murdered and they were recording it, right? That's a form of secondary, um, a sec form of secondary trauma. So it's something that we all should really be aware of and pay close attention to for ourselves too. How's it showing up for me? Is it impacting my, uh, my is it impacting the way that I show up to, to work? Um, is it impacting me outside of work, right? So we can look at behavioral issues, interpersonal issues, job performance, um, impact on our personal beliefs and values. When a person experiences something traumatic or they're re-traumatized, their body has this response. It just has a, a, a um, physiological reaction to the perceived event, attack, or threat in order to survive and essentially protect itself. And this response is, which I'm sure many of you heard of, the fight, flight, and freeze, uh, freeze, submit response. And then there's a fourth response called fawn. And this is really a response developed in childhood trauma where a parent 
or significant, um, a significant authority figure is the actual abuser. So children are going to this fawn-like response in order to attempt to um, avoid the abuse. So, and that voice could that abuse could be verbal, it could be physical, it could be sexual, and they do this by being a a pleaser. So, in other words, they really preemptively attempt to appease the abuser by agreeing, answering what they what they know that the authority figure wants to hear, and that could be by ignoring their own personal feelings and desires and doing any and everything to prevent the abuse. So, over time, this fawn response becomes a pattern. And individuals carry this pattern with them into their adult relationships and how they live their adult lives, including into their professional and personal interactions. And so this fight, flight, freeze, fawn is an automatic response. And people typically don't get to choose how their body will respond when it's under attack. And so the example that I typically um, like to give when I'm, when I'm talking about this is I use myself as an example I had moved to Chicago about 12 years ago or so at this point, and my whole family, I'm from a, a small town in Missouri, and my family did not want me to move to Chicago based off everything that they had seen, of course, on the news. Um, and I kept saying, like, I'm going to be fine, I'm going to be fine. And, you know, I always thought that because I was the oldest of seven and, you know, I kind of put my siblings in line all the time, like, you know, if anybody ever messes with me, you know, I'm going to, I'll be just fine, I'll, I'll be able to get them. Um, until I actually was mugged and I went into the freeze response. And so I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything. And so it's just an example of how oftentimes we, our body just goes into this survival strategy of doing whatever it needs to do to keep us safe. And so trauma survivors, we uh, typically have uh, symptoms instead of sometimes memories of all the events that may have occurred during the trauma. So I know sometimes when we encounter individuals, we think it's helpful for them to process or really talk about their trauma, uh, which can often re-traumatize some individuals, especially if it's early, uh, especially if they're still experiencing the trauma or something that recently happened, that this goes back to that level of vulnerability, right? That not all of us tend to carry, that all of us um, show up differently when it comes to vulnerability, that some of us are may, some of us are more resilient than others. And so why do individuals who've experienced PTSD or CPTSD or vicarious trauma have symptoms instead of memories? And that's because trauma literally lives in our body. It literally lives in our nervous system. And so when we are dysregulated, if we are triggered in any, in any way, our body has this response to maybe whatever it is that has triggered our body. And sometimes we don't, we can't connect to the dots of where this trigger comes from. And it can show up in so many different ways, as you can see here um, in this picture, right? It can show up in decreased concentration. It can show up in anxiety. It can show up in substance use, loss and sense of the future, hopelessness, loss of who you are, um, and some, some other things that are probably not listed um, on this slide as well. So the adverse childhood experience, which was a study conducted in the 90s by Dr. Vincent Felitti, is the largest and first research study that established a direct association between childhood trauma and adult health issues and concerns. So it really created this major link between childhood trauma and long-term health conditions. And it all began actually in an obesity clinic where Dr. Felitti had been supporting individuals who were losing half their body weight. So they were um, obese individuals who were losing 200, um, you know, over 200 pounds. And so once they would get to, they'd lose a certain amount of weight, he was finding that they were dropping out of the actual study. They were dropping out of the program. And so over time, he kept, you know, trying to figure out why they were dropping out. He would go back and he would review all of his notes and he'd be confused as to why they're losing weight, coming here to lose weight, they're doing it, but they would leave. After, after losing so many pounds. And so he started interviewing all of the, the previous patients who had dropped out of the program by just asking them these really standard um, questions of, you know, how much did you weigh when you were born? How much did you weigh when you first started first grade? Uh, you know, how much did you weigh during all of these things? And so one of the questions he actually misspoke and asked, how much did you weigh when you were first sexually active? And so he started to find that individuals were responding by saying 40 pounds, 50 pounds. And so he went back and started interviewing all these individuals who had dropped out of, out of the study and found that most of these individuals 
had a, a traumatic childhood history of abuse and neglect and, and household dysfunction, which are kind of these three categories that you see here. And so these 18 questions were created for the ACEs study. And they are 18 questions where an individual, you can find this study, you can find it online as well. Um, you answer the 18 questions within these three sections and they're yes or no questions. And so it says the more questions or the more ACEs that you answer yes to, um, the more likely you are to have some behavior or physical or mental health outcome. So individuals who have four or more ACEs are really um, more at risk to having more behavioral, uh, behavioral uh, problems in life, right? Alcoholism, smoking, substance use, uh, physical and mental problems, uh, depression, suicidal threats, cancer, and the list goes on. And one that's not listed on here um, is autoimmune diseases as well. So Kaiser Permanente and the CDC continue still to do work around the study, even till today, um, of how these, of how trauma, especially childhood trauma, really impacts our, our overall behavior, physical and mental health. So trauma is a risk factor for substance abuse and addiction and vice versa. Substance abuse addiction is a risk factor for trauma. And so here we're gonna watch a, a video um, and I'm not sure if, if any of you have actually seen this. Seen this? It's about a nine-minute video, um, and it is uh, narrated by a physician by the name of Dr. Gabor Mate. And he has a background in family practice, and he really had this special interest. He's a retired doctor, and really took his work into an interest of uh, childhood developmental trauma um, and its impacts over our health. So he's he wrote a really wonderful book. Uh, called In the Realm of hum Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. And he looks at the root cause of addiction and really applying clinical and psychological view to the physical manifestations. And he really offers um, some great um, answers and insight as to why people uh, continue to really inflict these catastrophic kind of, uh, they do these catastrophic things in terms of using drugs and alcohol. The downtown east side of Vancouver, British Columbia is one of the world's ground zeros for addiction in that in a few square block radius, we have thousands of people injecting, inhaling, and ingesting drugs of all kinds and paying dearly for it. These people are often outside the law, certainly beset by many medical problems due to ingestion drug use including psychosis, including HIV, including hepatitis C, cancers, they die of overdoses. This is trench warfare. And the people that are the frontline soldiers dying from it are the people affected by addiction. So that's where I worked for 12 years. And uh, what I learned could be summed up really very uh, briefly by saying that addiction is not a choice that anybody makes. It's not a moral failure. It's not an ethical lapse. It's not a weakness of character. It's not a failure of will, which is how our society depicts addiction, nor is it an inherited brain disease, which is how the medical tendency is to see it, but it actually is a response to human suffering. And all these people that I work with have been severely traumatized as children. All the women have been sexually abused. All the men have been traumatized, some of them sexually, physically, emotionally neglected. And not only is that my perspective, it's also what the scientific and research literature shows. So addiction then is actually, rather than being a disease as such or a human choice, it actually is it's an attempt to escape suffering temporarily. By the time I, I went to work there, I had already been in family practice for 20 years. I'd seen a lot and I was quite attuned to the impact of early childhood experiences on adult psychology and adult brain physiology. But I just hadn't seen the depth and the degree until I went to work down there. So really it dramatized and confirmed for me, made it very palpable how addiction is a response to suffering and that what people need in response to addiction is not judgment and not simply symptom control. They need to be helped to heal from their trauma it is all about trauma. The media, the television, cultural depiction of addicts is usually as 
desperate people, but without showing why they're desperate. So all that shows is the desperation for the drugs. Uh, there's no indication of what's driving that desperation. And hence you see them behaving in all kinds of dysfunctional ways, aggressive or manipulative, unpleasant. But again, there's no three-dimensional sense of the reality of these people. It's the what that's really all about for them. Is it possible to cure people? You're speaking from the Western model, where I am the expert, and you're the one with the disease, and I'm going to cure you, I, like you cure a piece of meat. You know? No. The answer to that question, framed that way, is no. It's not possible. If you're asking, is it possible for people to heal from trauma sufficiently that they don't have to keep escaping into addictions to lessen the suffering of their trauma, yes, that's entirely possible. But the question is, under what conditions is that possible? And under the conditions that the pain in London, UK, or Vancouver, British Columbia, or in New York, New York, or any place, under the conditions that are obtained socially, legally, and from the perspective of medical practice, it's hardly a likelihood because we're approaching it from the wrong direction and with the wrong perspective. If I could constantly demonstrate that with this particular population, I could affect a 5 or 10% success rate of getting people to leave the addiction behind, I'd be considered to be genius because our results are so poor. When I say ours, I don't mean ours specifically in Vancouver. I don't mean that. I mean the overall treatment model for addiction is so poor in succeeding with the most affected segments of the population. So, I mean, addictions are like everything else on a spectrum. So a lot of people do heal from addictions, but the most inveterate, most entrenched addicts, they have the hardest time. And they're also the ones whom society gives the hardest time so that it makes it even harder to help them. Never mind they don't get the help they need, they actually get actively punished. And so what you've actually got is traumatized children, and children are traumatized, that affects how they feel about themselves, which is deeply ashamed, because a child always believes that it's about himself. So if, if I'm being hurt like this, I gotta be a terrible person. Or if I was sexually abused, why didn't I fight back? I must be a very weak person. So there's a deep sense of shame. Then there's tremendous emotional pain that accrues from abuse and neglect. Tremendous emotional pain that is hardly possible for people to bear. Now they have to soothe their pain with substances, whether compulsive behaviors. Then the trauma itself, given that the human brain develops an interaction with the environment, shapes the brain circuitry in such a way that the person will be more likely to find relief from the drugs. So the very physiology of the brain is affected by every trauma. So then you take these traumatized people and you make their habit illegal. It's not illegal to drink yourself to death. It's not illegal to make yourself sick with emphysema or lung cancer by means of cigarettes. But it's illegal to use other substances so now you take these abused, traumatized people, you place them outside the law, you put them in jails, and you harm them all their lives, treating them like criminals and bad people and failures and rejects and less than human. And then we wonder how come they don't get better. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle of taking traumatized people and then re-traumatizing them and then hoping at the same time why don't they listen? Why don't they get better already? Why don't they give it up? Well, they don't give it up because the more hurt they are, the more they need to escape. In other words, the addiction wasn't your problem. The problem was that you had a lot of emotional pain you didn't know what to do. So the addiction was really an attempt to solve the problem. So when you say, why do people use substances or why do they engage in addiction in general? It's because they have a problem they don't know what to do with. And if you really understand their addiction, you have to ask, well, what gave you so much emotional pain? And how come you didn't have the internal resources? This is not a judgment, it's simply an inquiry. How come you lacked at some point the internal resources to deal with that pain in a more creative, forward-looking way that would help you resolve the pain rather than to perpetuate it? So really, really what it was is that the addiction came along without to solve a problem. You had no other solutions for it at the time.
and that's the case for all addictions. So why do people use? Why do people engage in addictions? Because they have deep emotional problems they don't have the means to resolve on their own. That's why they use. The average medical student, until very recently, has never even heard the word trauma in their education. It doesn't show up. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about its impact on the brain, on the personality, and on the emotional life of people, and its impact on people's physical health. It's not a word that we mention. The trauma phobic. The fellow doctor said to me, the medical profession is trauma phobic. Psychiatrists these days are trained mostly in this biological model of psychiatry where everything comes down to a biological brain disease. Here, let's give you a pill. The last thing most psychiatrists know how to talk about is actually emotional pain or its origins in human experience. You think they know how to do that, but they don't. They're not trained in it. It's not part of the predominant medical ideology. And, you know, as a physician, I can tell you, we like to think of medical as a science, and it has certainly great scientific achievements uh, to its credit and great scientific insights to buttress its successes. But it's as much as ideology as a science. And ideology has certain hidden assumptions that are hidden from the people that believe in ideology. So that if something is excluded by ideology, you just won't see it. And so that you can be talking to somebody about your addiction and the simple question, what did they do for you? And how come you're in so much emotional pain? It doesn't occur to me. You know, trained in a classical manner. No, this is true not just for physicians, it's true for a lot of psychologists as well. Who are more interested in solving your problems and getting you to overcome the behavior than in asking, well, okay, where does the behavior come from? What are you still carrying inside that's making you behave that way? Now can help you resolve what's inside you. Not just how do we help you change your behavior, but how do we help you change? Now that's what healing is. And that happens inside a person. So it's never a question of anybody curing anybody else. But we can guide people to healing if we ask the right questions. I always think that this um, video really um, in, in Catholic and, and showcases um, the, the pervasiveness of addiction. And so I have a quote here by Dr. Stephen Porges that says, trauma compromises our ability to engage with others by replacing patterns of connection with patterns of protection, right? So when you encounter um, people, students, community, your family even, right? This is something to be mindful of. This person is really using all of these skills, whether they're good or bad, to survive. They're really using these skills as protection. And so I'm gonna jump into talking about the racial trauma piece um, and try to get through this as, as much as I can. I apologize in advance. Um, I wanna be mindful and respectful of everybody's time and know that we have about 17 minutes or so. Um, and I will be honest that I have more than 17 minutes worth of information remaining here. So um, sorry if it feels like I'm speeding through this just a bit, um, but I want to give as much information as I can. So um, before we actually jump into all, I think jump into all of the racial trauma piece, I think it's really important that we that we have a chat for a few minutes about a few definitions that are important for us to, to know and really to keep in mind uh, today and always, right? So this information that I'm going to talk about is very different from cultural competency, uh, which I think a lot of people are trained in or have an awareness of it that you're required to take maybe for CEUs and things, which involves this awareness and knowledge, right? But it doesn't really include action or structural change. It's something completely different. So we know that words really have um, their multiple uses and really reflect this tremendous diversity that characterizes our society. So universally agreed upon language is, is uh, or relating to racism is really kind of non-existent. We're starting to see this come to fruition more these days. So we know that most, the most frequently used words and any discussion on race can easily cause confusion, which can lead to controversy, at least to hostility, right? It leads to, uh, which is why it really uh, is important to have some degree of shared understanding, particularly when we're using the most common terms. So this way, the quality and meaning of our dialogue and discourse on race can really be strengthened or improved or really enhanced. And so we know that language can be used deliberately to engage and support 
community anti-racism coalitions, partnerships, initiatives, and it could also be used to really inflame or divide them. So discussing definitions can engage and support uh, these initiatives and partnerships and, and coalitions. And so I think it's important for groups and communities of people to decide to the extent at which they must have a consensus of, of where it's okay for people to disagree. I think it's helpful to keep in mind that uh, the words that are used by people um, really discuss power, privilege, and racism, and oppression hold different meanings for different people. And that's and it makes sense that, you know, based off of our different experiences. So for instance, people at different stages of development or their learning and their education can really attach to different meanings to words like discrimination or privilege or institutionalized um, racism. So when people are talking about privilege or racism, the words they often use really come with um, emotions and sometimes assumptions that are not necessarily spoken. So we have here internalized racism or internalized oppression. Right, so the situation that occurs in a racist system when a racial group oppressed by racism supports the supremacy and dominance of the dominating group by maintaining or participating in a set of attitudes, behavior, social structures, and ideologies that undergird or support the dominating, dominating group's power. So as people of color really are victimized by racism, we start to internalize it, right? That is, we, we start to develop ideas, beliefs, actions, and behaviors that really support or oftentimes collude and uphold with, with racism. Racial equity, a condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicated in a statistical sense, how one fares. So when we use the term, we're really thinking about racial equity as a part of racial justice. And thus we include work to address root causes of inequities, not just their manifestations. So this includes elimination um, and major shifts of policies, practices, attitudes, and cultural messages that reinforce differential outcomes by race or that fail to eliminate them. So this would require really seeing differently, thinking differently, and doing work differently. So racial equity uh, is about results that make a difference and ones that actually last. So racial justice, the systemic fair treatment of people of all races, resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. Racial justice or racial equity goes beyond anti-racism. It's not just the absence of discrimination and inequalities, but also the presence of deliberate systems and supports to achieve and sustain racial equality through proactive and preventable measures, right? So this is this idea of um, operationalizing racial justice means reimagining and co-creating a just and liberated world which requires us to understand the history of racism and the systems of supremacy and superiority and address past harms, right? Centering uh, BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color and building up communities culturally, economically, and, and politically, right? Practicing love along with disruption and resistance of really these status quo or social and political issues surrounding injustice. Microaggressions, which are these everyday verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights or snubs or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate some type of hostile or derogatory negative message to target persons based solely upon their marginalized groups. So this term was coined back in the 70s by a um, psychiatrist in University of Harvard professor named Dr. Chester Pierce. Um, and so this was created after he had witnessed um, multiple individuals uh, using these slight snubs toward uh, people of color. And so an example of this would be something that I hear um, all of the time is that how well spoken I am or how eloquently I speak. Um, another example, you know, would somebody say to an Asian American person that, you know, your English is, is really well, right? Presuming maybe that the Asian American wasn't born in the United States. And there's many other examples that fall within microaggressions, right? Racist policies. So any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between or among racial groups. So these policies are written, unwritten laws, rules, procedures, processes, regulations, guidelines that continue to govern people, that govern all of us. So when we think about racist policy, there's, there's really no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity between racial groups. So racial, racist, racist policies are 
also expressed through terms as structural racism, systemic racism, institutional racism as well. So when we hear someone say, oh, you know, he or she or they, they're being racist, we're really indicating that this person is actually supporting racist policy through their actions, through their intentions, or they're really expressing racist ideas, right? An idea that suggests that a racial group is inferior or superior to another um, in, a, in a different way. And then we have power, right? Power, this unequally distributed globally in, in the United States in so many different levels that, you know, although power is really uh, conceptualized as having power over another individual, we also can use power collectively, right? We use collectively to really make um, structural and internal internal changes. So the important concept of power as it applies to anti-racism um, is really clear, right? Racism can't be understood without understanding that power is not only an individual relationship, but it's a cultural one. And that power, that these power relationships are shifting constantly. Power can be used maliciously, it can be used intentionally, um, and individuals within a culture may benefit from power oftentimes in which they are unaware. Um, racism, right? Racism equals race prejudice and social and institutional power. It equals a system of advantage based on race. Racism is a system of oppression based on race. It's a system of it's white a white supremacy system, right? And then we think of anti-racism, right? Working actively opposing against racism and advocating for change in our social lives, economics, and politics, all different all different ways, right? So you're really supporting anti-racist policies through your actual actions and expressing anti-racist ideas. So prejudice, racism, and discrimination. What's the difference between them? So prejudice is this irrational or unjustified negative emotion towards somebody, right? You just hold this belief. Racism is prejudice plus the power, right? That gets perpetuated through the practice of policies and cultural beliefs. And then discrimination is an actual behavior, right? It's an actual action that somebody takes towards an individual or a group of people. And when you put all three of these together, you are left with oppression, right? You're left with the unfair, cruel use of power to control other people. And so we see this big difference between prejudice and discrimination is that a person can be prejudiced. They can hold irrational and negative beliefs about a group of people, but they may not actually act on them. They may not actually discriminate, which is rooted in the, in, rooted in the behavior. And so when we say racial trauma, you know, what does that actually mean, right? Maybe these are some of the things that come to your mind. Racism, diversity, history, prejudice, uh, superiority, and many other things that could probably fit on here that are not included. Racial trauma or race-based traumatic stress is also another term that it's used, right? So this mental and emotional injury that, that is caused by encounters with racial bias and ethnic discrimination and racism. Um, any individual that's experienced emotional, painful, sudden, or uncontrollable racist encounters at risk of suffering from race-based traumatic stress. So in the United States, people of color are oftentimes right? They're vulnerable because they're born into these systems of living under supremacy and oppression, right? So really these experiences of, of, of racial trauma and race-based traumatic stress have a profound and detrimental impact on individuals and our communities, uh, which really lead to symptoms like those of PTSD, CPTSD, vicarious trauma. And in fact, the symptoms actually mirror each other. The, the same uh, symptoms that we see in people who experience PTSD, CPTSD, and vicarious trauma, they all overlap. They look the same for racial trauma. And racial trauma can be caused by a myriad of things also that overlap PTSD, CPTSD, right? Exposure to stereotypes, fears about your personal safety, um, witnessing somebody receiving abuse or being abused, microaggressions, racist abuse of loved ones, direct exposure, right? The list is, these are just a few, it's, a, it's an unlimited list. Um, and there are many other things, right? Historical, com historical um, traumas, right? Inequities such as, you know, lack of access to appropriate schooling or medical treatments and so many other things. And so these symptoms really, as I said, mirror those of PTSD, right? You have the re-experiencing of the distressing events. So these are all things that we see um, in that picture where I had that orange blurb of trauma with all the different things that individuals can experience. And so the main, another di not the main difference, but another difference that we see in, in individuals is more so um, not only these 
uh, psychological impacts, but the um, physical and health impacts as well, right? So cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and all of these things, higher allostatic, high, higher allostatic load, which means this wear and tear over the body because of chronic stress, right? So when we know our body's in this state of distress, it activates our stress hormone and it helps protect us, right? We're always in this fight, flight, freeze response. response. And so these experiences that are chronic and that are consistent, our, our nervous systems and our bodies will become taxed and the hormones become unbalanced, really leading to some of the physical illnesses and conditions that we see listed here and many other ones that I don't have listed. So I'm gonna skip through a couple of these um, slides here. Um, to talk about a couple things just because I know we're getting close to time. Um, so historical and intergenerational trauma, which is a term that was coined back in the back in the 1980s by Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart to really explain the whole constellation of the family um, and community experience and reaction to trauma and the actual unresolved grief that came from it. So we think about historical trauma, right? This intergenerational trauma that impacts entire communities. It refers to cumulative emotional, psychological wounding as a result of group traumatic experiences. So it's passed on across generations within a community. And we refer to this as epigenetics, that it is literally genetic, that these genes get passed down generation after generation to generation. And the impact is not only about what happened in the past, but also what is still happening in the present to target groups of people or actions by others that really serve as reminders of this historical targeting. Um, so just a couple of things that I'll briefly mention. Jack, Dr. Joy DeGru um, created the post-traumatic slave syndrome, which I highly encourage um, you all to, to check out um, and kind of her map ideology of um, post-traumatic slave syndrome. And then also, also Resna Menachem, who's created hip theory as well, um, who really um, focuses on more about um, uh, black body trauma uh, and its impacts of this intergenerational and generational impact that has continued to persist for years and years and years. And so we take kind of the ACEs study that I talked about earlier and we can put it into um, these pair of ACEs here, which is you see the ACEs are at the very top, all these things, substance abuse, emotional abuse. And we see this tree is really seeped um, in soil that is uh, unhealthy, right? How do we expect all of these things to occur if, if this tree is planted in, in poor soil. And now even more so with um, COVID, we've seen its impacts as well on communities in such devastating ways, and particularly, particularly in the country's kind of uh, fragile fault lines, right, where race and poverty will be taken into account. So what would it look like to take some of this information? How do we assess for racial trauma? What does that piece look like for, for all of us? How do we prevent um, barriers from taking place, right? This comes with us, um, you know, having conversations about about race, right? How do we prevent um, how do we prevent uh, individuals from not healing or individuals from not being able to express something that is so pervasive, right? Uh, leading in this can lead into oversight if we're not having these conversations. It can lead to individuals receiving inappropriate treatment. It can lead to somebody not being able to heal lead to somebody not being able to show up in the education system or setting, in their classroom setting um, in a healthy way. And so um, assessing for, for racial trauma, um, I know our practice um, uses the Yukon um, Racial Ethnic Stress Trauma Survey, and it really helps with um, creating conversation around talking about race. Um, and it's just a, it's a verbal interview that you can give, and this is I have a picture of it here, it looks like this. You can actually find it by doing a quick Google search. Um, they typically label as the unrests um, survey. It's about five questions that really invite conversations um, about, um, about race and racial trauma. So how are we coping with all of this? How are people really taking care of themselves, right? Are you doing things that are, that are allowing you to be seen and heard? Are you allowing others to be seen and heard, right? Are you practicing self-care? Right? There's so many different types of self-care, what that looks like from all different personal um, places, right? physical, emotional, financial, space, all of these things. Are we taking care of ourselves so that we have the opportunity to heal? Right? We can't prevent race-based traumatic stress. We can't pre prevent racial trauma. 
I know we're right at time. I'm wrapping up here in a couple minutes. So if you have to go, thank you for being here. Uh, we'll be here for a couple minutes afterwards uh, to try to finish up these two slides. Um, so beginning to heal, what does that actually look like, right? Because we can't prevent race-based traumatic stress or racial trauma, but we can cope with some of the self-care techniques that we just listed and coping techniques. But what does it look like to actually heal? How do we move forward to heal? Because we can't prevent racial trauma from actually happening, unfortunately, right? It's going to continue to happen. And healing really starts within ourselves. We can't heal a wound that we refuse to name. So it really in involves parts of your body using your body to heal, right? Because growth after trauma really does exist, post-traumatic post -traumatic growth, resiliency, all of these things do exist. So how are we um, really taking the time to care for ourselves so that we do have the opportunity to invite these conversations that really uh, promote healing and taking action in many other ways, right? So look for opportunities to speak, amplify voices that are marginalized, inform and educate yourself, engage in activism, right? Take action, uh, use your privilege to, to support BIPOC individuals, right? So in whatever way that looks like for you, don't, uh, don't assume, ask. There's so many different things that, that we all can do to really um, to take action and really do the work. So I'm gonna stop here, um, Orlando, um, and open up and see if there's a couple of questions that have come in while I still want to be respectful of time here for the next couple of minutes. Yes, thank you, Rayel, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, as we said, you guys can ask questions now. And we do have one question. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what is the name of that video that you posted earlier? Um, let me see. I don't know the actual name of the video, but is it okay if I, I can email this link to you all, Orlando, and you can share that? Okay, that's fine. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a list of participants, but that's probably the easiest. I don't know the actual name of the video. It's a great video. Great, great video. Highly encourage it should be shared uh, universally. It was a great video. We'll wait a minute for other questions to come in. Sure. Okay, the next question is, recognizing racial trauma and substance use as a coping strategy, how can we best support individuals of color coming into our recovery spaces? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, I think it, it, you know, something really would be helpful is that um, I know I kind of breezed over relatively quickly. Um, I'm actually going to go back to it here as I'm answering the question, is the unrest survey. Um, so this, um, this is, this survey is really, really wonderful. And we use it at our practice, um, where I work in private practice, where our team is, we don't have that many therapists of color, but it's really a great way if you don't identify as a person of color to invite some of these questions into the space to really gain an understanding of maybe what racial trauma, how it has impacted an individual. And honestly, not many people are actually, I think racial trauma is something that's starting to be talked about more and more and more. So sometimes people may not even have an understanding that they've been impacted by racial trauma or that it's impacting their overall well-being or the way they show up. Uh, so I think this is a really great starting point to, to check out this uh, survey to, to really give you a guide to ask some of those questions to open up dialogue. Great question. Thank you for asking. It seems we don't have any other questions, so I'll just close with a closing statement. Okay. Please keep it. Please keep an eye out for an email for GoToWebinar that will come about in an hour after the program. The email will have a link for you to fill out an evaluation. 
This evaluation will really help us out with future events. And certificates will be issued within seven to 10 business days from the webinar, and we will have the webinar available on our website. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you.